A nefarious nightmare contains themes that may be explicit or triggering for some. Specific warnings and disclaimers will be mentioned in the show notes. A nefarious nightmare assumes all parties that are mentioned in these cases to be innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law. Listener discretion is strongly advised. You can help us grow the show by leaving us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can join our Patreon for lighthearted bonus content. With this, welcome to Season 5. In practice, the standard for what constitutes rape is set not at the level of the woman's experience of violation, but just above the level of coercion acceptable to men. Judith Lewis Herman If you never heal from what hurts you, then you'll bleed on people who did not cut you. Unknown Today we will discuss how victims and survivors react differently to crimes like these. It's a lot like grieving a death. Everyone does it differently, and there is no right or wrong way to do so. But nonetheless, each victim and survivor are impacted by this for the rest of their lives. We will be diving into this at length with the hope that the right people, whether it's the FBI, CIA, or any other tech-savvy investigator, hopefully will hear this and just want justice for these women as much as we do. Unfortunately, the assailant is unknown as he or she is hiding behind an anomaly that would be a computer screen and advanced technological know-how. With this, I'm Amanda Cronin. And I'm Courtney Fenner. And A Nefarious Nightmare presents Still Minding the Beehive, Surviving Sex Crimes, Part 2. Let's get a little housekeeping out of the way before we dive in further, shall we? We will be at the True Crime Podcast Festival in Austin, Texas this year, August 25th through 27th. Get a discount on your tickets by visiting truecrimepodcastfestival.com and use the code BEES at checkout. B-E-E-S. We are going to have a great time there. Also, don't forget to join our Patreon. It's only $3 a month and it gets you bonus content and a palate cleanser. That being said, any money we make off of this will definitely help fund our trip to Austin for the festival. So please help us out. We really want everyone listening to understand something that we've alluded to thus far. Every victim in this is taking this a different way and reacting the way that they know how. There's no right or wrong way to react to something like this because each and every individual human being is different. One might act as though it's not a big deal. Another might be in focus mode, and let depression happen later. And then another might be extremely traumatized by it years later, where they dive deep into addiction, depression, and or suicidal ideation. Some survivors unfortunately do not live to see justice and in the same tone, some assailants don't live to see justice either. It's a sick, sad world indeed. A world that depends on those of us who are victims and survivors to continue to fight and speak out about things that have happened to us that never should have happened. Sometimes we have to advocate for others despite ourselves. Sometimes we have to advocate for ourselves and sometimes we have to advocate for everyone. But 100% of the time, speaking out and advocating does indeed help. And we will dive into the why a bit later. Have you ever spoken one-on-one with a victim's family or survivors of a crime? Or perhaps you have been one yourself? If the answer is yes, I guarantee you have noted moments of apprehension, anger, standoffishness. And sometimes it's hard to not take it personally. But if you look at it from an outside scope, you'd notice that And really, can you blame them for feeling this way? Many times, victims, families, and survivors alike have to relive the worst day of their life over and over again. They have to endure re-traumatization. They have to continuously retell their story to law enforcement or detectives. And many times, the crime isn't taken seriously. They have to repeat themselves, enduring shaming and blaming from others being continuously disappointed, 
by the law doing the bare minimum at best, or when media shove themselves in for a good story. Some victims, unfortunately, die by suicide because they simply can't take it anymore. We will touch up on the Amanda Todd sextortion case a bit later, by the way. They're constantly wondering after everything that they have been through, who is out to get them? Who is out to benefit off of them? Who else is going to harm them or their family? They have a hard time trusting because once upon a time, they had their lives livelihoods, humanity, innocence, and trust just poof, stolen. Oh, and by the way, if you think for one second that victims and survivors of crimes like these have it easy, they do not. They have to endure all of the above, but they also battle depression and constant fear. They're constantly being shamed by either the perpetrator or random outsiders who hear of their story, and even Sarah Turney Eric Carter Lundin and others like them have had to deal with victim blaming and shaming, and it's no wonder they both are angered and fighting so hard for an ethical true crime world, because they've seen firsthand all of this time and time again. And myself? I too have been a victim of a cult. I've seen my share of shame and blame from my own family members even, and was it okay that I joined a cult and did I blame myself? Not okay, and I blame myself constantly. None of us who have survived such ordeals should have to hear it from anyone else, because we do enough of that on our own. But I, for one, will fight for all victims and survivors. End of story. The following is a reenactment of some screenshots that our Phase 1 survivors have received. This will be the first of many reenactments, so pay close attention over the next few episodes. Notification from Jane 1. Snapchat. Can I ask why? 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 Why do all this to someone you don't know? Because I want. Because I do whatever I fucking want. Nobody can do nothing about it. Okay, but why? I said because I want. I can delete them all from the internet in like five seconds for just one Jane X pick. Good luck. Don't need it. Remember, I still have it on my cloud. I can keep posting it and making accounts of just you. Or just send me Jane X and I'll delete it all. I'm gonna start sending it all to your friends. I got all your contact, honey. Narration, Jane X. After that, I kept receiving emails about failed login attempts on my Snapchat accounts. The emails always included IP addresses and none of them were consistent. They would be from various states in the U.S., not even in the same region. I ignored this, as the account they were attempting to hack was one I never used. In July, I received a message request on Facebook from some girl I haven't spoken to since about ninth grade. She said my nudes were posted. I asked for proof because I was sure there was no way. She sent me the link to a website that had a picture of my boobs posted and my full name visible. I asked her how she knew about this. She directed me to a post made by a Facebook user that we will call Advocate, who posted screenshots of messages who has been receiving from a fake account asking him to buy and sell pictures of local girls. Advocates post simply stated for girls to be careful who they send their pictures to because some creep was at large. It sparked a total uproar. I think the post got hundreds of comments, everyone accusing a different person. Someone posted the link to the porn site with all of our photos that were posted. The general consensus was this guy from Omaha. We will call him Suspect One. He was being accused because the user that pinned the photos on the porn site had a photo of him as the profile pic and the username was similar. Despite the accusations, Suspect One claims to be innocent. I did message him on social media and he explained to me that he is a victim too since he is being framed. Social Media Post Advocate Y'all need to be careful who you're sending your explicit photos to. This post is in no way directed towards the women on this list, but Unfortunately, y'all trusted someone, and they weren't trustworthy. I'm in no way trying to blast y'all's names or anything. I'm just trying to make it known that there are messed up people, and y'all need to be careful. Much love to all. Suspect 1. Dizzy AM. I got a list of 24 ladies here. You've blocked Suspect 1's Facebook account. You can't message or call them in this chat and you won't receive their messages or calls. Suspect 1. We want more. Let me know if you got some so I pay you 500 or we can share it. Let me know if you got some so we can have a deal. Images sent in message requests are covered. Tap to see blurred image. 
Suspect 1. Facebook. You're not friends on Facebook. 2. Mutual friends. September 8, 2022. 7.53 p.m. Give me your information for your porn sites. Now I know what you're doing. It's not me, but I understand why you would think that. I'm a victim too, hon. I'll send you the link if you please report it. You can now message and call each other and see info like active status and when you've read messages. Send me the link. Got you. It's a sex.com site. Here's the link. Proceeds to send link. That clip is just a heartbreaking reality of what all of these survivors and victims are going through. At the end of the day, no matter how soft or tough they might be on the surface, they want closure, peace, to feel heard, understood, and validated. They want, no, they need their stories to be taken seriously. And unfortunately, the bare minimum isn't going to cut it. That's where we are coming in. The following is an interview with Lexi, who has been very outspoken about what happened to her, as well as spoken with many news outlets to raise awareness on not only her case, but others as well. The thing about Lexi is, as you all will come to find out, that she was not aware that pictures of her were circulated, as these were shared as a joke with friends. Nothing more, nothing less. Unfortunately, they fell into the wrong set of anonymous hands and were distributed online. With that, here's Lexi. My name is Lexi Elsie. So I'm 25 now. So this this first started when I was 24 then, but the photo was taken, I believe, in 2019, if I'm remembering right, 2018 or 2019. So I would have been about 22. I'm originally from the Fremont, Nebraska area, and I moved to Florida about a year ago. I don't have any kids. I am a huge cat person, so I do have one cat that lives with me now and one that I had to leave back home in Nebraska with my mom, so she's living there. So kind of, I am kind of a, a cat mom to two cats. And uh, besides that, I'm an artist, I'm a photographer, I do portrait drawings, and I really like going to church, and I love listening to all types of music, and by all types, I actually mean all types, unlike some people. I like actually will listen to anything, so <laughs> yeah, there's that. For me, this all started about a year ago. I would say it was probably March of 2022. I'm trying to think, because we just, and went into a new year. So I'm like, which year was it? <laughs> it's 2022. Yeah. Um, and it basically started because Ashlyn, my friend, got a message on Snapchat from this perpetrator. And he was saying, you know, send me pictures of Lexi or else I'm going to send yours to your whole, all your friends and family. I have all your contacts. And Ashlyn was like, no way, dude, I don't have anything of Lexi and I'm not sending you anything of Lexi, even if I did. So like, go away, you're a loser. You know, she blew it off and she let me know about it right away. Of course, at first I was like, what the heck? And I didn't really feel like I had anything to worry about because I was like, I don't really, I mean, I, I have not shared anything like that with anyone that would, that would send this guy anything or, you know, I had no reason really to worry about it in my mind. So I was still, I wasn't on like red alert, but I would say like maybe yellow flags popping up. You know, I was like a little bit more cautious about what I was doing online and a little bit more cautious about, you know, walking to my car by myself and things like that, because, you know, we don't really know who this guy is. He's uses so many different usernames and I was trying to figure out who it is. And I, at this point have no reason to believe that there, this is any guy that I actually know in person. I think that I'm kind of guilty by association because this guy wanted to come after Ashlyn and he realized that we're friends and he's seen my picture on her profile and decided to ask her for pictures of me. He actually did start to message me in, I think it was like July, but this is after I realized that he did get a photo of me. Somebody messaged me on social media, someone that I haven't even talked to since like eighth grade and was like, hey, just so you know, like your nudes are posted. And I was like, what are you even talking about? I knew exactly who, like, I knew it, it correlated to this situation, but I was like, yeah, right, there's nothing of me. And then she, I was like, I need you to send me a link. She sent me the link, I opened it, and bam, there's a picture of my boobs, not taken by me. It wasn't a picture that I took myself. It's a picture I don't even remember. I only recognized it was me because it shows the lower half of my face 
and it should obviously know what my body looks like and then also it was i can tell it was taken in my mother's living room so and i can tell that the whoever took this photo was sitting on the couch of my mom's living room and it appeared that i was like probably doing my hair or and i could tell i was blonde at the time you could, i could see a couple of strands of my blonde hair so i knew exactly kind of like the time frame for this and i was like well i was always doing my roots i was always doing my hair when I, it was a lot of upkeep to be blonde for me so um i just kind of was like maybe that's what i was doing and you know my friends and i would jokingly take pictures of each other like lol your boobs are out like i don't know it seems probably to the older generation it seems really ridiculous but when you walk around with phones constantly and i think that our generation is just more like lol because you don't expect anyone to see it and it's not it's not like i was taking seductive pictures in the mirror with my top off or anything like that so i that's why i didn't think i had anything to worry about in the first place so but and i didn't recognize the photo because it wasn't taken by me i would guess that it was probably on ashlyn's camera roll because ashlyn is specifically one of those friends that we would jokingly take pictures of each other like in public restrooms and like just random stuff like that like lol got ya kind of thing um and then also because she was also a victim in this and because other girls had reported that they had been hacked that their snapchats had been hacked um i kind of believe that that's where it came from so it's and it's a really low quality photo but it's still disturbing that it's out there and then and also another reason why i believe that these other girls have been hacked is i do have another snapchat account that i made like years back but it's not one that i ever used but it does use my real name it's like lexi lc1 or something and i kept getting emails saying that someone was trying to log into my account and i'm and this is before I even knew about, I knew about he messaged Ashlyn and asked for nudes of me, but this is before I knew that he actually had anything of me that he posted. And I looked at the IP addresses cause I kept getting these emails and they'd be at like weird hours of the night. And the IP address was always somewhere bizarre, somewhere random in the US of someone trying to get into my Snapchat account. So then I, I'm piecing this together and I'm thinking this is probably that guy because if other girls have reported that their Snapchat accounts or their camera rolls, how, I don't even know really how it all works, but if they reported being hacked and I'm getting emails about someone trying to log into my Snapchat account, I mean, around the same time, like, you know, put two and two together, it's not that hard, but luckily that wasn't even the account that I used. So when I went to law enforcement for this, they pretty much so we're like well where'd the photo come from where was the photo taken because there's all these jurisdiction issues and they're like talking about who took the photo and i'm like i really i was like i don't know for certain i said i think my friend took it as a joke one time and it got out it got into the wrong hands and i don't permit to this photo of me being used online on pornographic websites you know it was not taken for those intentions and they said well they might try to come after your friend though if you continue to pursue this and i'm thinking okay but that doesn't really make sense though because if my friend has permission to have the photo so like i would say like yes i give ashlyn permission if she's the one who took it i give ashlyn permission to have that photo because that's just the dynamic of our friendship we were just goofing around taking pictures of herself and i don't want to go after her for something like that she's not the one who posted it on a porn site that's where the problem is i'm like the problem is it being you know leaked to the public and being used as blackmail and to torture me with whereas my friend just had it as a joke and probably didn't even remember that she had it just because i give consent to ashlyn doesn't mean that i give consent to everybody <laughs> law enforcement kind of gave me the runaround with this so and because i moved to florida it's kind of become not only just a nebraska state problem inter-county inter whatever but now it's a it's an interstate problem because i moved to florida and actually when like when all this all this started i would lived in nebraska when the photo was taken i lived in nebraska when it was posted online and this this perpetrator started messaging me personally and threatening to like ruin my life i lived in florida so i'm in contact with the fremont police department and i think that they i think they were kind to me and i don't think that they were um i don't know like undermining me at all i just think that they didn't have 
what it takes to solve this kind of case. So at some point, the FBI down in Tampa, Florida got involved. They called me. I think they're like, they must have had my case transferred there or something. Cause I never reached out to them first. They called me and they left a voicemail. It's a female agent and she's like, hey, this is agent whatever at the Tampa FBI, please give me a call back. And I'm like thinking, great, oh my gosh, like someone's, I'm actually gonna talk to an FBI agent, like someone's actually on this, someone actually cares. And I, I'm, especially because she's a woman, so I'm thinking, you know, like, cause sometimes with dudes, like, yeah, I mean, they don't get it, I don't know. <laughs> so I call this FBI agent back and I, uh, I ask for her and I talk to her. I'm like, hey, I'm returning your call. This is my name. This is what I'm calling in regards to. And she's like, okay, so start kind of tell me what's going on here. And so I told her, well, you know, basically the whole story. I said, this guy, he's been after me. He's posted pictures of me online. He's messaging me repeatedly on social media. Even if I block his account, he makes new ones with new fake names. And he sends me these photos. He's even Photoshop some pictures of me that aren't really me and he's posted pictures of other girls claiming that they're me but they're not me and he also attacked my three-year-old niece by putting a uh, uh, he took a picture of her from my sister-in-law's Facebook and photoshopped a penis by her face and sent it to me and said that he was going to sell her information on the dark web. Anyway, so I'm just telling, I'm just going off. I'm like telling this FBI agent everything. And she's like, well, why don't you just block him? And I'm thinking, okay, I mean, I do, but he makes new accounts. And regardless, that's actually not the concern here. The concern here is that there's illegal content being posted online that I don't want out there. And she's like, well, when's your birthday? And I told her and she's like, okay, so you're an adult then, you're a legal adult. Were you a minor when these photos were taken? And I was like, I mean, no, but that doesn't matter because Nebraska has revenge porn laws and Florida does too. And Florida actually has one that includes doctored images or Photoshopped images that are not really the person, you know, which he's done that to me too. So I'm thinking like, why doesn't this FBI agent know the law? And she was so, I mean, like condescending, rude. She's like, you need it. She goes, it's not a crime to message you on social media. I just don't understand where there's a crime here. And I'm going, woman, I'm like, can I talk to an FBI agent who actually knows the law? Because this is a joke. And I was so mad. I was literally shaking and I was like in tears. And after I hung up with her, I actually called the FBI back and I asked to talk to like some supervisor and I like filed a complaint about her because I was like, I was like, I happen to know the law and apparently you guys hire agents that don't know the law and I cannot believe the way she treated me. You know, if you don't know the law, it's one thing you can say, you know, I'm not familiar with uh, these types of crimes, so why don't I go ahead and look into it and then I will get back to you if I find that there's any illegal activity taking place. That would have been perfect. But no, she was so rude. So, so, so rude. Like I, I don't, I was like flabbergasted by the way I was treated. I've been trying to do that. I mean, I've gone to the news. I've done, I've interviewed with multiple reporters. There's been at least three stories that have aired that I've been a part of that I know about. Like both in, I did one, I did two with a news company in Omaha. And then since I moved to Florida, I actually did a news story about this with West 2 in Orlando. So, and I, the only reason I did that is because I, I just wanted there to be public pressure because I feel like oftentimes in this society, nothing is done unless people are outraged, which is really pathetic, honestly. I like, I, like it didn't even have to come to this. All it took was, like if law enforcement would take me seriously, I did the story in Orlando after I was treated so badly by the FBI. So, and there was even a Senator involved in that story that they had interviewed who actually wrote the, I think she wrote the bill or the law or whatever for, the sextortion, like doctored photos and things like that. Cause she was a victim of it at one point too. And so she was a part of the news story and she's like, yeah, I, this happened to me. And I like wrote this law into practice here in Florida. So 
it's kind of been a process with this because at first, I mean, I was like livid, like I was shaking and I wanted immediately to call the police. And I was a little bit more hopeful that actually something was going to be done about it. So I, I think it was a little bit more amped up. But then like, you know, and I have a dark sense of humor. So for me, I can kind of laugh about things at least. But, you know, sometimes it really does get to you because you do sit back and you think you're like, holy crap, I can't believe that this photo or photos of me are out there for anyone to see at any time. And I've wondered, you know, how is this going to affect my job? Like, what if I want to find a, a job in the future and I, and I can't because they go online and this is what they see, you know, I've, it's freaked me out. And I, I have anxiety problems anyway. Uh, so I've kind of been like, I should change my name. I should, you know, do all this stuff. Like I just, it's, it's, it's crazy because my reaction to this totally depends upon where I'm at mentally otherwise, because sometimes I'll be like, it's going to be okay. I'm going to get through this. Uh, you know, I didn't do this. And and my job currently knows about this whole situation and they're very supportive. So then, you know, if I'm thinking rationally that day, I'm like, well, I, it's okay. Like future jobs, like they'll understand I'm truly a victim. Like I didn't do this on purpose like or anything. So, and then of course, over time, you just kind of get desensitized in some way because after a year and this guy has messaged me repeatedly it's the same photos i've seen over and over again because he can't get any more pictures of me and that's why he gets so mad he re messages me repeatedly and thinks he has to take pictures of my family members and dock them up too and put them on the website under my name you know he does all this stuff so after a while i'm just like oh look there it is again great and he's like, this is never going to stop, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I, I realize that. And that's why my brain has kind of gone into the, uh, I don't even really give a crap anymore mode. It's kind of sad to be desensitized to the fact that your own like nude pictures are out there and like not even care who sees you naked anymore because it's become so normal to you. Like that sounds so messed up coming out of my mouth. I'm like, I don't care who sees me naked because everyone already has. So it's like, I don't even have any sense of like privacy or concern for like my own autonomy anymore. He's victimized several girls. He's messaged me on social media with lists of like 40 plus girls in the Omaha metro area that he's victimized. And he basically is just bragging about it. So I know that there's tons of other victims and other victims have reached out to me on social media saying that they're having problems and they're having anxiety and they have developed eating disorders and such from this and so that's a lot to handle too because not only now do I have to deal with my own emotions surrounding this but I also feel some sort of responsibility for helping other women through it too. I'm really familiar with the Amanda Todd case because I, I brought that up during my interview with one of the news stations because I believe it was just this last summer that the guy who was the perpetrator for the Amanda Todd case got sentenced. And that crazy thing, she would have, she was like my age. Amanda Todd died like 10 years ago from this, this kind of crap. And I remember that being such a big story when I was like, a, I don't know, freshman, eighth grader. And I just couldn't believe it. And then now here I am, I'm kind of also that way. And I'm thinking, this is my main point and case in point that I said to the reporters I've talked to is I can't believe after how long this has been a continuing problem in the country and in the world, really, internet crimes, especially ones of sexual nature, given the fact that teens have killed themselves over things like this and it's taken... 10 years or more to get someone convicted you know what i mean like it just doesn't make any sense to me i'm like if this isn't a new problem this is something that's been going on i think that law enforcement is somewhat going easy on this person because of the fact that they haven't i feel just because of the way the fbi treated me and stuff i feel that they haven't really made a genuine effort as to finding out who this person is. And in that sense, they've kind of made this person believe that they can get away with whatever they want. And that's why it continues to happen. On the other hand, I do understand that when someone's using a VPN and when they're using multiple fake accounts, fake names, and they're given evidence they may not even live in the country, 
It's very hard, so I do get that, and I realize that even if the FBI were to take this case very seriously starting now, I may not even have answers for uh, a while just because of how complex this case is. I have talked to my friends and family about this because a lot of times they've been involved in it. Like with my niece being involved, of course, I had to let my brother and his wife know because now their toddler's involved. Uh, I actually, I lived with my sister and brother-in-law at the time that I first found out that my photo had been posted. So I told them about it. And um, my brother-in-law actually has some connections with the news sources. So that's another reason why I talked to him about it. And he actually helped me organize a, um, a meetup with this reporter. So uh, I kind of did just, just uh, within reason, <laughs> I guess. I don't really talk to my mom that much about it or anything. Pretty much anyone who needs to know about it will know about it. I do feel like I have a very good support system just because, like I said, you know, my job's been really supportive. Uh, you know, they haven't blamed me for anything. And kind of like my boss is like, let's get this guy. Like she's the same way. And she's a very like true crime person and things like that too. And, uh, you know, I, I'm in therapy. I have a therapist and I've talked to her about the same situation. And there, there have been times I've been worried about it just because also now there's another minor involved. Like my, I call her my aunt, but she's not really my aunt. I met her at church and she's just some like 40 year old who adopted me. Um, but, uh, I lived with her and her family for a while. So I guess this perpetrator connected me to her family and took a picture of her 12 year old daughter, 13 year old daughter. I think she was 12 in the picture, um, took that photo and again, did some doctoring editing to it, uploaded it online. And at first I was like really freaked out. I was like, great. Like she's going to hate me. She's going to wish she never met me. You know, I was having like all the, all the things, all the feelings. And then I, you know, I was like, but I have to reach out to her. I have to tell her about it. And she already knew about the situation anyway. And she goes, you know, I don't, I don't like your pictures being out there at all, but I also don't want my, you know, she goes, my, my daughter's a minor. That's, that's a problem. Like, that's a child pornography. That's a problem. And I told her, I said, do not, do not tell your child, your daughter about this because I do not want to freak her out. And I don't want to make her feel any type of way. I don't want to ruin her mental health or anything. That that was like kind of my main concern. So it's like I I have support a lot in this, but you know, because this guy keeps throwing a wrench in my support system by targeting these minors within my community, it almost makes me feel sometimes like afraid to talk about it because it makes me almost have like a sense of guilt or like other people are mad at me because now they're being targeted for no reason because of me. Cause like, I'm a very rational person, but also sometimes there's feelings I get in the way. There's feelings and emotions you have to do, you know, checks and balances. As far as listeners go, I think that, and I would say just don't, don't take pictures of yourself like that. And don't let your friends take pictures of yourself like that. But in all honesty, in all honesty, let's be a little bit realistic here. If you do have pictures like that out there or you have them on your phone for whatever, for whatever reason, if there's any pictures or anything of that content, definitely make all your socials like private. Like you need to put your stuff on lockdown if you have anything like that out there possibly going on because these people are relentless and they know how to hack apparently. So get a double authenticator app or whatever. Um, to make sure that no one can get into your accounts because this guy has also, he messaged me and told me he had my Gmail account. He, he's like, I have all this stuff, all your, and then I kept getting text messages from Facebook saying, this is your password reset code. This is so I like, I know someone's trying to get into my accounts, but because I have things kind of cracked down now, it's been a lot better for me, but it does make me worry for people who are very unsuspecting of the whole thing and don't know that they're like, they have a target on their back. So that's just one thing I want viewers to know is that, I mean, 
it was no joke when we were growing up and everyone told us to be careful what we put online, like literally be careful what you put online. I did not take it that seriously then, but I definitely do now. And if it, I mean, it's, it's becoming more of a popular thing than it ever used to be. So I think that's maybe why back in the day we didn't take it as seriously, but now just with how widespread of a problem this is becoming and with how law enforcement is not giving uh, like any concern towards it at all i think it's best that everybody just lock their stuff down and be really careful be careful posting minors online too especially and you know because you don't know who's looking i would absolutely ask listeners to not judge girls who are going through a situation like this because they may not know the full story one of the news news uh, stories that i did actually i saw some of the comments on it on social media and i just based on the way that story was framed i can understand maybe where they're coming from because i didn't feel like we really got the full story in there whatever it's fine it was kind of a last minute saying i believe but some people were commenting and they were saying with a little bit of common sense this whole thing could have been avoided and stuff like that which to some degree yes i understand like you shouldn't post stuff like that in the first place like you shouldn't take pictures like that and like i never had an only fans or anything i know that some girls do and even though only fans does have a policy that you can't take and redistribute things that you purchase from there it still does happen it falls into the wrong hands and like obviously criminals don't care about the policies <laughs> like they don't so like i do understand a little bit of where they're coming from but at the same time they didn't know the full story i am like an actual like true not the other girls not that the other girls aren't victims but i'm like i didn't i didn't even take the picture of me so how can you be like oh with a little bit of common sense this could have been avoided i'm like okay a picture was taken of me without me knowing while i was topless in my own home so tell me again how it's my fault like you know that that's one thing that i really want people to know it's like you don't know where all these pictures came from of these girls it doesn't necessarily mean that they've been taking them and like giving them to these strangers and then now they're crying about it like that doesn't necessarily have to be the case really what i hope to gain from releasing this particular episode is i well a i want to bring awareness to situations like this i know there's tons of other victims of this out there there has to be and they need to know that they're not alone and they need to know what steps to take to resolve their problems and then also b i would like some just being able to put a spotlight on this situation i'm really again i'm just with that public pressure i'm just really hoping that someone will hear this who has some is in some position of power and wants to help and can help and that this person will end up behind bars at some point in the near future. I, you know, it's just really hard when we don't even know who the person really is. I mean, we can speculate all day, but it doesn't really help us if we don't know who it is and we can't know who it is unless someone wants to take it seriously. And so that's why I think it's really important to talk about these things. Otherwise, all of us, all of us victims of this crime are gonna suffer in silence for the rest of our lives. Before we wrap up, we wanna give you the timeline of victims that have come forward. While it doesn't seem like it's too many, we all do believe that there are more victims out there who are just paralyzed with fear of coming forward. The known victim timeline as it stands at the time of this recording, Jane Doe, 22, at the time, a minor in her pictures, July of 2022 in the North Bend area. Jane Doe, 25 at the time, June 2022, Omaha area. Jane Doe, May of 2022, in the Fremont area. Jane Doe, April 2020, again March 2022, Papillon and then Fremont area. Jane Doe, May of 2022, in the Fremont area. Jane Doe, 24 years old at the time, March 2022, Hooper area. Jane Doe, 22 and 23 at the time, all on November of 2021, December of 2021, and July of 2022 in the Fremont area. Jane Doe, December of 2020, 24 at the time, Fremont area. Jane Doe, March of 2020, 
23 at the time in the Omaha area. John Doe, minor, November and December of 2021, Fremont area. Jane Doe, age 12 in the photo, Bellevue area, February of 2023. And Jane Doe, age 2, Fremont area, September of 2022. Jane Doe, 23 at the time, unknown month in 2019. And there are at least 23 total victims here and counting. But we unfortunately do not know the remaining areas, ages, or time of when this started occurring. We do know that this is all in the Nebraska area, mainly around the Fremont or Omaha areas, respectively. While Ashlyn might be the spearhead of this, Lexi was instrumental in helping to compile as much detail as possible to get this story out correctly. So we want to take the opportunity to thank her and for everyone who participated in this series and for being willing to open up and be vulnerable so that we can all reach a common goal, apprehend and put away this anonymous assailant. Before we close out, we wish to extend an invitation to other victims and survivors of sex torsion, sexual assault, and sex crimes in general. We want to let you know that our platform is always open to you. We have a message for this anonymous assailant. What you are doing in the dark will come to light. These lives have been ruined, and you think that you want a game against these innocent people? But Courtney and I want the victims to adjust those crowns and take their fucking power back. And we know that one day you, king or queen assface, will sit on that stainless steel throne inside a six by nine by 12 foot prison cell, adjust your crown accordingly to you anonymous bitch. Lexi, as well as all of the victims and survivors, is a bee. Bees are strong, resilient, yet vulnerable. We must protect the bees at all costs. For without bees, we as a human race are doomed. So be vigilant. For when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. The music used in the theme was originally by Ghost Stories Incorporated. Remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional background music is provided by Epidemic Sound. A Nefarious Nightmare is scripted, researched, and produced by Courtney Fenner and Amanda Cronin. This podcast is a Cloud 10 podcast, managed by Sim Sarna, Sahiba Krieger, and Jamie Rice of Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. I'm Lainey Hobbs, and as always, be vigilant. For when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Hi, I'm Jamie, host of Murderish, a podcast that gives you a 3D look at gripping murder cases. Just the facts, no banter. By the end of each episode, you'll know who was involved, details of the crime and the trial. Also featured on Murderish is my personal story about the time a strange man followed me home and entered my bedroom. Listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. That's murder with ish at the end. Murderish. Listen to Murderish on the iHeart app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.